Hi everyone, welcome to today's online school GCSE chemistry session on recycling and rusting. Um, I hope you're all staying hydrated and not feeling too hot right now. I'll try and not make today too kind of heavy on the content. Um, so as I said, we're doing recycling and rusting. It's a one hour session from two until 3 p.m. Um, and we'll start off with a quiz as usual and then kind of go into content and exam questions. Um, if you haven't met me before, my name is Aman. I study medicine at King's College um, and I've done plenty of lessons with my tutor and I've done all the my tutor online school chemistry GCSE sessions. Um, so we'll start off then just by looking at the learning objectives for today. So, oh, here we go. So first of all, we'll be evaluating the process of recycling, um, know the process and conditions of rusting and explain the methods used to prevent rusting. So I think the subjects today are a little bit dry, so we'll try and make them as interesting as possible because um, they are really important subjects. And often these topics are ones that are tested in the types of questions where you have evaluate. So looking at the advantages and disadvantages. So they tend to be the long answer questions. So it's important that we understand um, both recycling and rusting. But before we go into the content for that, let's do a quiz testing last week's content. So if you were here last week, um, we looked at the biological methods of extraction and the electrolysis of copper. Um, and the reason we looked at biological methods um, was because copper comes from low grade ores and um, extracting copper from low grade ores, which means that there's less copper in them, can be really difficult and really costly. So that's why we use biological methods. So. If those of you that want to join the quiz, go to menti.com and type in the code 761226. Um, so I'll just wait for some of you to join. So for anyone that's just joined the webinar, we're about to do a quiz. If you go to menti.com and use the code 761226. Someone's asking if we can do the quiz at the end. Um, unfortunately not, because I do this quiz as a recap quiz of last week's content. So that's why we do it at the beginning. So I'll just wait for a few more people to join. Um, anyone that's just joined the webinar, menti.com um, and the code is 761226. I'll just give it a couple more minutes. In the meantime, if anyone's got any questions on last week's content um, or anything for today, please pop them into the chat or the Q&A function and I'll answer them um, as we're going along. Okay, let's start the quiz then. So the first question should be coming up on the screen now. So what happens at the anode in the electrolysis of pure copper? Is it that oxygen is produced from the hydroxide ions? Oxygen is produced from the sulfate ions? Copper ions are released from the copper anode or pure copper is produced from the copper ions? So if you remember the electrolysis of copper is a bit different to what we're normally used to and there was something special that happens um, at the anode. Okay. Great, so actually none of you got the answer. So the answer is that copper ions are released from the copper anode. So in normal electrolysis, your metal goes to the cathode, which is what happens. So the copper will go to the cathode, which is the negatively charged electrode. But at the anode, you get the non-metal ion. Now you would expect then, usually when we do the electrolysis of copper, the electrolyte or what's in there is copper sulfate. So you might expect that sulfate ions and then obviously the hydroxide ions from water because it's um, aqueous would go to the anode. And usually that means that the sulfate ions um, don't get produced at the anode. Instead, hydroxide ions go to the anode and form water. That's what you would expect to happen. But in the electrolysis of copper, something else happens. Because our anode is made from copper, what happens instead is that the sulfate ions and the hydroxide ions are relatively stable. So they don't actually want to lose any electrons um, so that they can become back to neutral. Instead, what happens is that the copper, anon, uh, the copper anode sorry, will lose electrons itself to become copper, um, copper ions. And so the copper ions will then go to the copper cathode. Um, so it's a process of just producing as much um, copper as possible through copper ions being released from the copper anode. 
Um, so this answer here is about the cathode. Uh, so the pure copper produced from copper ions is from the cathode. Oxygen would happen in normal electrolysis, but with copper, it's something different. Okay, so the next question should be coming up on the screen now. For anyone that's just joined, you can join the Menti quiz using the code 761226. So what's the name of the process which uses plants to extract metals from low-grade ores? So you have to type the answer in here. So there were two biological methods we looked at last week. One used plants, one used bacteria. What's the name of the process which, you, which uses plants? If, if you're not in the quiz, you can always send me the answer either in the chat or the Q&A function, whichever you prefer. Okay, um, great. So I can see that um, one of you definitely got it correct. So the answer is phyto mining. Um, so phyto mining. Some people said bio leaching. That's the other process which uses bacteria. Um, plantation, not quite, not phytosis, um, and not bio extracting. So the two different processes are phyto mining, which uses plants, and bio leaching, which uses bacteria. If you need a recap on that, my webinar from last week should be up on YouTube now, so you can go and watch that, um, and where we go over that in a lot more detail. Okay, the next question should be coming up on the screen in just a second. What is the name of the acidic solution produced when bacteria break down low grade ores in the process of bio leaching? So you may remember when we do bio leaching, bacteria break down those low grade, low grade ores and they produce a substance. And we need to know what that solution, that acidic solution is called. Is it sulfuric acid, leachate, bacterial acid, or carbonic acid? So it's got a special name. Um, great. Yep. So two of you got it correct. It is leachate. So sulfuric acid is produced in phyto mining um, by the plants. Um, so that was a good answer, but not in bacteria, uh, not in bio leaching. In bio leaching, it's called leachate. Um, carbonic acid is just a different type of acid. Um, and there's no such thing as bacterial acid. Um, so well done to those of you that got that correct. Okay, the next question should be coming up on the screen now. So which gas is released in the process of phyto mining? I'm going to give you a clue. In the process of phyto mining, we burn the plants. So now that I've told you we burn the plants, which gas is produced in the process of phyto mining? Excellent. Yes, three of you got that correct. Carbon dioxide. So whenever we burn something, carbon dioxide is released. Um, actually, sulfur dioxide is not released. Although the acid is there, the sulfuric acid, um, sulfur dioxide is not released. Um, so, but good. Um, it is carbon dioxide. Okay. So the last question, I think, then coming up on the screen now, which of these is not a section of a life cycle assessment? So we went over life cycle assessments last week as well. Is it destruction of the product, using, reusing and maintaining the product, manufacturing the product and its packaging, extracting and processing raw materials? So three of those are correct. One is incorrect. Which, of, which one is incorrect? So there are four um, sections of the life cycle. Excellent. Two of you got that correct. Destruction of the product. So um, the life cycle starts by extracting and processing raw materials. We then manufacture the product and its packaging. Then we use, reuse and maintain the product. And the final step is called the disposal of the product. And the reason it's called disposal and not destruction is because not every product is destroyed. So some might end up in landfill to be destroyed or just to kind of sit in landfill. Some might be recycled. Um, so it's called disposal of the product um, rather than destruction. So excellent. Well done to those of you that remembered that. Again, if you want to go over that again, it'll be on YouTube um, from the webinar. Okay, so well done to Mr. Taco um, for winning that one. Okay, great. Any questions on the quiz at all, please pop them into the chat or the Q&A function. Um, okay, let's go back to the lesson then. So we went through what the learning objectives are for today. So we're starting off with recycling um, and there are a few concepts to understand um, and then we'll draw some mind maps on the advantages and disadvantages of recycling. So there are three common metals that are recycled um, in the UK and worldwide. So starting off with aluminium then, we know that aluminium can be used as cans, so things um, like drinks. Um, tin foil is a really common use of aluminium, so they're kind of the two most common uses of aluminium. We've been through it before where we've looked at the extraction of aluminium, where we use aluminium oxide. It's a molten um, electrolysis um, that goes on to extract aluminium. So what we're interested in today is recycling. Um, and aluminium itself um, is recycled and it's melted to produce ingots. Does anyone know what an ingot is? 
Does anyone know what an ingot is? So it's just a fancy word. Um, something. I'll just wait for a couple of you to answer that. So does anyone know? Yep. So someone has said it's a bar of metal. That's a really good um, answer. So essentially we melt lots of aluminium and when we clump it all together. So um, if you imagine something like melting chocolate and then allowing it to solidify all that if different types of chocolate and then allowing it to solidify into a big bar of chocolate made of lots of different um, chocolates, that would be kind of what an ingot is, but me uh, metal. So it's a big bar of metal um, and it'll have lots of different types of aluminium in there. Um, so that's what we tend to do because then we can use that um, aluminium so as an ingot. Iron, another common metal um, used for car parts. Um, steel is an alloy which contains iron um, and also bicycle chains. We've looked at the extraction of iron before. So when we looked at displacement reactions, you know that carbon is more reactive than iron. So we can use carbon to extract um, um, sorry, iron is more reactive than carbon, so we can use iron. Um, so we can use carbon, sorry, to extract the iron in a displacement reaction. And what's really key about iron is that it's a magnetic um, material. So that means that when we recycle iron, it's very easy to separate, um, and it's also melted to produce ingots once we've separated it. Um, so someone's raised their hand. Um, usually, that means that you want to ask a question. So if you put the question into either the chat or the Q and A function, um, I'll answer it for you. The next metal then is copper. So copper, its main use is in electrical equipment. So for example, in electrical wiring, because it's got really strong electrical conductivity. So we tend to use it um, for that. We looked at the electrolysis of copper last week. Um, so remember smelting just means heating it to really high temperatures to get it out from um, high grade ores, adding sulfuric acid again from high grade ores. And then when we've got low grade ores, which just means there's not much copper in them, we can use phytomining or bio leaching. The recycling of copper um, can be quite a lengthy process. And the reason for that is that copper isn't usually found just on its own. We tend to use copper in alloys. And when it's used in, as an alloy, it means that often um, we have to actually remove the other metals from the alloy because we want high quality copper. Um, low quality copper in an alloy isn't as useful. It tends not to be um, as great for electrical equipment. So that means that when we want copper um, and when we recycle it we have to actually separate it from its alloy so it can be a really lengthy process and also requires a lot of uh, money and energy. So any questions on the recycling of those three um, the metals those three metals the main points I wanted you to get from that is what an ingot is and how most metals um, are melted to produce those ingots and also about how we have to separate the metals so aluminium is quite easy to separate iron is also very easy it's magnetic but copper and those that make alloys can be quite difficult to separate so any questions on that at all okay so I thought we'd do kind of um, some mind maps then on the advantages and disadvantages of recycling. As I said, this is a really key topic at GCSE Chemistry and they like to ask you questions on this. So I can think of about four or five reasons for the advantages of recycling. Can anyone else think of any advantages of recycling? And we'll write them on the mind map. So if you can contribute to advantages of recycling um, and hopefully we'll make a mind map to together. Yep, so someone says it saves limited resources. Excellent. Um, I like that. It saves limited resources. Great. Anyone else got any answers? So saves limited resources. Yep, so someone has said reusable. So technically, when we recycle, yes, something is reusable, but that's not necessarily an advantage. Um, so I want specific advantages. Yes, it reduces pollution. Do you know why it reduces pollution? Why does it reduce pollution? So it's not enough to say it reduces pollution. We need to know specifically why. Good, someone says it reduces energy usage. Um, also reduces uh, pollution and landfill. So I'm going to write the reduces landfill down because I like that answer. So it um, saves space in landfill. So you'll remember most metals or something that can't be recycled will end up in landfill. So it saves space um, in landfill. Okay. So someone has said about pollution, what exactly is it that stopped? Why does it reduce pollution? 
Yes, the extraction process. I like that. So someone's talking about mining and quarrying. So we don't need to mine and quarry when we do recycling. So um, no costs or energy from mining or quarrying. Good. So I'm still looking for what specifically about pollution does it do? Yep, so it's greenhouse gases. It's greenhouse gases. So remember that usually we use crude oil um, to make plastics, for example. And if we're recycling our plastics or our metals, um, we don't need to use crude oil. And crude oil releases greenhouse gases when it's burnt. So because we're using less crude oil, so less crude oil, that means we're then doing having less greenhouse gases. And that reduces pollution. Good. Anything else anyone can think of? Yep. So the burning of CO2, so CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Good. Yep. So someone's talking about um, recycling having a huge negative impact on the natural environment. Yes. Again, that's from greenhouse gases. Good. Um, habitat destruction as well. Um, so these are kind of the four main reasons I thought of. So again, when we extract metals, we have to do mining and quarrying. So if we're not doing that because we're recycling, that saves energy, it saves costs, and also um, it saves, uh, stops greenhouse gases being released because when we mine and things, often we, need, we use big drills that re uh, requires energy, which releases greenhouse gases. Um, it saves limited resources. So if we're recycling and reusing, it saves limited resources. We already know, for example, copper, high grade ores are running out. So if we can recycle our copper, it means that we're saving our limited resources. It saves space in landfill sites, which again, I talked about the fact that a lot of things that can't be recycled or reused will end up in landfill. Whereas if we try and recycle and reuse as much as possible, we're saving space in landfill. And then less crude oil used, for example, to make plastics. So if we're recycling our plastics, we don't need to use as much crude oil. We know crude oil is a limited resource. As well as that, it releases greenhouse gases when it's burnt. Um, so for example, cracking um, and fractional distillation releases greenhouse gases. Great. Anyone got any other um, advantages? I think they're the main four. Um, if not, we'll go on to the disadvantages. Okay. Great. Let's go on to the disadvantages then. So I can think of about three disadvantages for recycling. So let's see what you can come up with. So disadvantages of recycling. What can we think of? Excellent. So someone said you still need energy to melt the metals. Really good. So remember we talked about ingots and ingots um, are basically blocks of metal. So lots of metal melted together and made into a block. You still need energy to melt those um, metals to produce ingots. So you still need energy to melt metals. Good. So that's one of the reasons I thought of. Um, so someone is saying recycling is not always cost efficient. Okay, why? Why is it not always cost efficient? Yes, excellent. It's difficult to separate. So it can be really difficult to separate metals. It requires and plastics and all the recycling. So if you think about any recycling that you do in your house, often we put a lot of plastics in there, for example, um, cans will go in there and someone has to actually go in and separate them. Often there are machines to do that, but that's still a lengthy process. So separating um, separating it can be really uh, time consuming as well. So separating, um, I'll just call it the waste. So separating the waste. Good. Anything else? So what about when you recycle something at home, for example, where does it need to go? What happens to any recycling waste that you have? Where does it need to go? Someone's saying that not 100% of recycled things are actually recycled. Yep, that's a really good point. It may stay on the land site. Yep. So what happens? What, who collects your recycling? Who collects your recycling? Yep, bin men come and re uh, collect your recycling. They then have to transport that onto a recycling plant 
the recycling plant, once something has been um, made into ingots, then has to uh, transport that somewhere else to be used. So all that transport and collection requires manpower, fuel for the um, lorries and things that take um, that recycling waste, and also energy um, just for, uh, so manpower energy, so human labor. So we can talk about transport um, of the recycling waste. So they are the three that um, I can think of. Has anyone got any others? So transport of the recycling waste because of manpower, fuel usage and energy usage. We still need to melt the uh, still need energy to melt the metals to produce ingots. And we need to separate that waste, which can take a lot of time um, and also either machinery or human labor. OK, great. So we've got the advantages and disadvantages of recycling, and that should help you when you need to answer long answer questions. So we are going to do some exam questions now, um, not specifically on recycling, but on the process um, on this whole topic um, of the Earth's resources. And the reason for that is that we've actually finished this topic of the Earth's resources. So just as a recap of everything we've covered, we've looked at the extraction of metals. Um, we've looked at recycling. We've looked at uh, phytomining and bioleaching. We've looked at treating water. So all four of those topics are in the um, Earth's kind of uh, resources um, topic. And then we'll be moving on to kind of the last topic um, of GCSE chemistry, which is looking at different types of things. So rusting is our first topic, um, which we'll be doing after the exam questions. So this is a recap from last week then. So this is just a mix of exam questions on the whole topic of the Earth's resources. So have a read of the question. It's about phytomining. So what are two advantages of phytomining compared to the traditional method? So a new way to extract copper from the land that contains low percentages of copper sulfide is phytomining. Phytomining uses plants. Plants are grown on this land and absorb copper compounds through their roots. Use this information to give two advantages of phytomining compared to the traditional method. Yep, someone's asking me to go back to the previous slide. I will go back to the previous slide while people think of um, two um, advantages of phytomining. So as I said, these are a mix of questions on the whole topic of the Earth's resources because in exams, they're not going to tell you which topic's coming up. So it's important that you understand um, the whole topic. Okay, any ideas then? What are the advantages of phytomining? Excellent. Um, so less energy is needed to extract the small amount of copper because we use plants. Good. Plants will remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Really good. Yep. Anything else? It's less expensive. Yes, definitely. So we don't need to use mining or quarrying. Yep. So someone said it can release energy when plants are burned. So I would say that's a disadvantage. So when we burn our plants, um, carbon dioxide is released. Um, so releasing energy when plants are burned is actually a disadvantage. So that answers this question over here. As well as that, um, compared to the traditional method, as it, a disadvantage could be that it's a lengthy process. So we have to wait for our plants to grow. Whereas when we're mining and quarrying, it can be quite quick. You know, we drill into the ground, get our copper ores, um, and then remove our copper from that. Whereas when we're waiting for our plants to grow, that can take a long, long time. Yep, great. So I think we've all come up with two advantages there and disadvantage of phytomining. So great answers that everyone is giving. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. So this is on water. What are the two main steps to use, uh, use to treat water from reservoirs? So if you think back to when we did treating water, um, we talked about how you can get fresh water called potable water from two areas, either from rainwater or, um, or you can get it from seawater. And remember reservoirs just means from rainwater because that water falls into lakes, rivers, um, and underneath into ground, into rocks. So reservoirs just means from rainwater. Um, and then seawater, in the UK, we don't get our water from seawater because we have enough water from rain um, to supply our population. So can anyone remember the two main steps? of treating um, rainwater. Yes, filtration is the first one. So you'll remember when we did this, um, filtration was the first step and there are about three or four different steps for filtration. And the reason for that is what? Why do we do filtration? What does that do? 
So this question is asking for the two main steps and a reason for each step. So what's, why do we do filtration? What does that, what's the purpose of it? Yes, excellent, to remove insoluble particles. So to remove insoluble particles. So it removes insoluble, insoluble means they do not dissolve, insoluble particles. Um, and as I said, there are about three or four different filtration steps. So it starts off um, using something called a metal grid where we remove all the large twigs and things from rivers, so the large particles. We then use sedimentation beds to get rid of, again, larger insoluble particles that get through the metal grid. Then we're trying to remove our small insoluble particles and then our very, very small insoluble particles. So about four filtration steps. What's the final step then? So we've got rid of everything insoluble. What else needs to be removed? So we've filtered everything out. What else needs to be removed? So someone has said that we need to use chlorine. That's correct. What's that process called where we add chlorine? Anyone remember? Yep, you can use ozone, so you can use chlorine, ozone, or ultraviolet light. What's the process called? What is it that we're doing when we add chlorine to the water or ozone or ultraviolet light? Why do we do that, or what's it called? Excellent, someone said to, re uh, to reduce microbes, so we do it to remove microbes, good. So what's the process called? So the second step removes microbes. What's it called? Not chlorination, close. So you can use chlorine, ozone, or ultraviolet. That's why it's not called chlorination because there are lots of different things that you can use. Um, it's another word for something being very, very clean. In a hospital, for example, you will find this type of environment. It's another word for something being very clean. Starts with an S, not sanitation. S T S oh okay S T any ideas sterilization yep yeah, excellent well done for the person that got that so it's called sterilization so sterilization so the two main steps for treating water from reservoirs, so from rainwater, is filtration to remove the insoluble particles and sterilization to remove microbes. Well done everyone um, for getting that word, excellent. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay, another question on water then. So most water contains dissolved compounds. The concentration of these dissolved compounds are higher in seawater than in drinking water. Pure water can be obtained from seawater by what? So there were two processes that we looked at when we um, tried to obtain um, water from seawater, so fresh water from seawater. One of them is there and one of them isn't there. Good, it's distillation. So well done to everyone that got that correct. It's distillation. Does anyone remember the name of the other process that you can use? Yes, excellent, reverse osmosis. Well done, so reverse osmosis is the other process. So distillation is exactly like how we do fractional distillation. The only um, difference is we don't have a fractionating column. So it's about boiling um, your seawater. And what happens is, if you remember when we looked at pure substances versus impure substances, impure substances have a higher boiling point than pure substances. So what happens is when we boil our seawater, the water is pure in there. And so what, when it boils, that water will come off first. It will boil off first. It will become a gas. It then goes into a condensing chamber where it becomes a liquid and then it will drip into another beaker where you get pure water. And the seawater that's left there, because it has a higher boiling point, it won't boil off. So that's the process of distillation. The other one that someone mentioned was reverse osmosis. And in reverse osmosis, if you study biology, you'll know the process of osmosis. So what happens is if you imagine we've got two beakers and in one beaker we have fresh water, so fresh water, and in one beaker we have seawater, um, which is salty. So let's say that's our salty seawater there. So usually in osmosis, um, water will move from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. So our pure water um, does not have anything dissolved in it. It's pure, so it's at a low concentration, which I'll write like that whereas our salty water has a really high concentration. 
and that's because it's got lots of salts in it so it's really highly concentrated so usually our water in osmosis would move from the low concentration to the high concentration but that's not what we want we want the water from the seawater to come into the pure water so we have to do a process of reverse osmosis and for that to happen you have to put a lot of pressure in to almost overcome the normal um, route of osmosis so that instead we get the fresh water from the seawater to go into the pure water like so. Um, so you need a lot of pressure and you have something called a semi-permeable membrane which allows only water to get through. Excellent, um, okay, so the boiling point of pure water is 100. Um, well done for those answering that. And yes, so what piece of apparatus would be suitable for measuring 25 centimeters cubed of seawater? I've had a couple of answers. I'll wait for other people to answer that. Um, nope, we are moving on to more content on rusting soon, for the person that's asking. So what piece of apparatus do we use to measure? Yep, so someone's saying a burette. Yep, burette would work, pipette would work. Anything else? There's one other thing that you could use um, that's actually probably more likely that you would use in a classroom. Not a beaker, um, it's similar to a beaker. It tends um, to, to be called something else. So it's called a measuring cylinder. Um, and that's something that you're probably more likely to use in a classroom, so measuring cylinder. Um, good, but pipette, burette, measuring cylinder are all absolutely fine. So. Final question on water then, how could the student check that all of the water had evaporated? So we've got a mass um, in, an, uh, in a evaporating basin. They measure 25 centimeters cubed of seawater and pour it into the evaporating basin. They heat it up until all the water has evaporated. How can we check that all the water has evaporated? Does anyone know? How can we check? Yeah, excellent. So what we can do is we can heat up what's in that evaporating basin and essentially we can weigh it before we heat it up and after we heat it up. And if that weight stays the same, that means all the water has evaporated. If that weight changes, it means not all the water has evaporated yet. So we wouldn't expect the weight um, of what's in there to change um, if all the water has evaporated. Excellent. Well done, everyone. Okay, so I think I've got one more question then, um, and this is just uh, life cycle assessments. So scientists compare the environmental impact of three types of disposable grocery bags. They do this by carrying out a life cycle assessment for each type of bag. They compare bags made of paper, biodegradable plastic, and polythene. Which of the following factors should not be included in a comparison of the environmental impact of these three types of grocery bags? So again, this is about thinking what is actually not in the life cycle assessment. So two of them are not included. Um, have a think, I'll, I'll number them one to six and then you can tell me that way. Nope, we're not finishing early today. Um, we're just doing exam questions now just because we've finished the topic of Earth's resources and then we're moving on to rusting. So we're just doing this last exam question and then we're moving on to rusting. Okay, someone is saying three and five. I agree, I definitely agree. So the energy input for making the bags from the fibers or polymers is definitely important. So that would go into the manufacturing stage of the uh, life cycle. The environmental impact of disposing of the bags, again, that would go into the fourth stage, which is the disposal. Whether customers are charged for bags, remember we don't think about cost. So that is definitely one of the answers. The environmental impact of making the fibers or polymers from raw materials again that would go into the manufacturing stage which bags customers prefer to use not included and then the energy impact um, input as the bags being disposed in the disposal stage great answers everyone okay so let's go back to the content then so we're now thinking about rusting so most metals will corrode um, when exposed to air oxygen to form a metal oxide. So it's the oxygen and air that they react with. Corrosion, as I said, happens to all metals. So for example, sodium will react with oxygen to produce sodium oxide. And this corrosion is bad for most metals. It tends to weaken them. So it means they can't necessarily, they're not necessarily as strong as they were when they were in their pure form. Rusting is a type of corrosion. So rusting, the meaning of rusting is that it's a type of corrosion that only happens to iron and its alloys. 
So iron and its alloys. So steel is one of the alloys of iron that you need to know about. And the difference between rusting and corrosion is that, for example, when we think about, let's think about aluminium corroding. So aluminium will corrode, so it will react with oxygen to produce aluminium oxide. That aluminium oxide layer will protect the aluminium. And it will mean that the rest of the aluminium can't corrode. So it's essentially the top layer of the aluminium that corrodes. But rusting, what happens is that when rust forms on iron or steel, it can flake off. And when it flakes off, it exposes more of the iron or the iron underneath to then rust again. So rusting is a process that actually tends to um, harm more of the metal than corrosion will. So corrosion will tend to form a layer on top of the metal that's protective, whereas rusting will tend to actually impact the whole of the metal because rust can flake off, whereas, for example, an oxide layer cannot flake off. Does that make sense? Does anyone want me to go over that again? So the difference between rusting and corrosion. Okay, um, as I said, if anyone's got any questions on that, um, please uh, just ask me. But it is important that you understand the difference between um, rusting and corrosion. Okay, so Let's just watch an experiment that you're likely to do at school then on the conditions um, of rusting. So we've got three test tubes over here um, and we're going to place iron in an iron nail into each of them. And this is going to show you which conditions are needed for rusting to occur. Okay, so we've got an iron nail in each of our test tubes. In test tube A, we are going to pour water in, so just water, and then we're going to put a stopper in or a bung. So test tube A just has water. In test tube B, we are adding water and oil. Um, we'll go through why we add oil in just a second. So test tube A has got water and oil. So remember test tube um, A has got water and air in there because it's a test tube so there's air in there. Um, although the bung will have stopped any more air getting in there will still be air in there. B has got water and oil and no air and C um, has a piece of calcium carbonate gone in or two pieces of calcium carbonate gone in um, and there's also going to be a bung. So as a recap test tube A has water and air. Test tube B only has water and test tube C only has air. So the oil stops any um, air getting in, that's why there's only water there. And then test tube C, which had the calcium carbonate pieces, essentially removes any vapor from the air, so it removes any water from the air, so there's only air in there. So if you have a look at A, you can see a really heavy process of rusting going on. So remember A was where water and oxygen was present. In B, there's not really any rusting going on, so in B there was only water present. Remember, because the oil stops any oxygen getting through. And then in C, we had calcium carbonate in there. So that takes any water out of the air. So there's only oxygen in there and there's no rusting going on. So this experiment, that's a very common one that you do in school, shows you that for something to rust, so specifically iron and steel to rust, you must have oxygen and water. Um, if you want to watch that video again, I will pop it into the chat function for you all to see. Um, so I've just sent it to you all um, on the chat function and it will show you um, that oxygen and water is required for iron to rust. Remember, test tube B had water and oil. The oil stops any oxygen um, getting in. Um, and test tube C had calcium carbonate. As I said, calcium carbonate removes any water from the atmosphere, so there's only oxygen in that test tube. So this equation over here looks quite daunting, and you do not need to know this equation. It's for those that are interested. It can um, be asked in the higher tier, but you would never have to derive it. The only thing you would have to do is to balance it. So the important thing that we all understand is that when iron reacts with oxygen and water or steel reacts with oxygen and water, something called hydrated iron oxide is formed. And that is a fancy word for rust, hydrated iron oxide. So this is what's going on in the equation. Iron plus oxygen and water forms hydrated iron oxide. 
Hydrated just means that water is bound to the iron oxide. So it doesn't form its own compound, it's bound. And if you do A-level chemistry, you'll learn a lot more about um, hydrated compounds and how they work. So essentially you've got water bound, which is why there's a dot here. So if you can see that dot there, um, that's what it means that it's bound to the iron oxide. It's not something you need to know at GCSE chemistry. But if you're planning on studying A-level chemistry, you'll learn a lot more about it and it's quite interesting. So I have a question for you then. In this um, question or in the process of rusting, is iron oxidized or reduced? So that's a common exam question. Is iron oxidized or reduced? What do we think? Okay, so I've had mixed answers. I've got some people saying oxidized, some people saying reduced. So let's think about the definitions of oxidation and reduction then. So what, who remembers the mnemonic for oxidation and reduction? What's the mnemonic so that we remember? There's one that I've definitely told you about a couple of times. Yes, oil rig. So oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. And that just is talking about in the process of electrons. So oxidation is loss. So oil, O-I-L, oil. Reduction is gain. R-I-G, rig. But remember, the oxidation also just means oxygen is added. So oxidation does also just mean oxygen, oxygen is added. And if we have a look at iron, the iron becomes oxidized. It becomes iron oxide. So iron is oxidized. And in the process of losing um, electrons, that has also happened. So if we think about it ionically, iron starts off as Fe, which means it's neutral. It's got everything that it says it's supposed to have. When it becomes iron oxide, it becomes Fe2+, plus. Um, actually in this case, Fe3+, plus. so Fe3+. Plus. And so what's happened is it's got a three positive charge. That means it's lost electrons, so it has been oxidized. So iron is oxidized in the process of rusting. The same happens to steel. So if you get asked that in an exam question, um, you'll know that iron is oxidized. So well done to everyone that gave me that answer. Does everyone understand that? Because that's quite key. So oxidation is the loss of electrons, but it also means the addition of oxygen. So you can see that um, iron means uh, when it's reacted with oxygen, it means that it's oxidized. Good, okay. So the next thing we need to know about then is we know how rust forms and we know how it's bad because it affects the whole metal. So we need to know how we can prevent rusting. And there's lots of different ways. Um, the three main ways are physical methods, electroplating and sacrificial protection. Um, I'm gonna show you electroplating in a bit more detail and I'm going to explain about sacrificial protection in, in a bit more detail. Physical methods, we're not going to really go over too much because they're quite self-explanatory. So if we add paint to a metal, so specifically to iron or steel, it essentially stops any oxygen or water accessing that metal. So it's almost kind of protecting it. So it stops anything accessing, accessing it. And the reason for that is that paint tends to contain something called anti-rust chemicals. Um, so a lot of paint contains anti-rust chemicals, which just means it's protective. You may remember from the experiment that when we add oil, it essentially stops any oxygen getting in. So it stops oxygen. So that's why if we oil a metal, it will stop oxygen reaching it. So only water can reach it. And remember, we need water and oxygen um, for rusting. Coating with a plastic, this is again just protective. The plastic will stop any oxygen or water um, reaching the metal. So they are physical methods. We've added something to the um, metal. It's something that you can do physically. We can all do it in our homes if we needed to. Something um, that you also need to know about is electroplating. And what's really key is that you understand that electroplating is the process of adding a less reactive metal. So a less reactive metal will mean that if that react less reactive metal comes into contact with oxygen and water, it will not react with it. So if you imagine we've got a piece of iron here, and then for example, we add silver on top. So let's just say we've got a layer of silver on top that silver is not reactive. So if any oxygen or water touches that silver, it won't react with it and it can't reach the iron below it. So that's what we call electroplating. And the reason it's called electroplating is because the process of forming it is through electrolysis. So we have to use electrolysis to coat iron, for example, with silver. And what's really important that we understand is what happens in that electrolysis process. So let's have a look um, at a diagram. 
So in this case, we've got an iron nail and that's our cathode. So remember in electrolysis, we have a negatively charged electrode, which is called the cathode and a positively charged electrode, which is called the anode. So negative, which is our cathode and positive, which is our anode. So our iron nail is our cathode. Our anode is our copper rod. Now, if you remember in the reactivity series, copper is less reactive than iron. So when we do electroplating in this way, we make our anode the less reactive metal, our cathode, the metal that we want um, to be electroplated, so to be plated with that less reactive metal, and we have an electrolyte um, which contains um, the metal that's being coated onto. So we want copper to coat onto that iron because it's less reactive and won't react with oxygen and water. So in the process of electrolysis, what happens is in our electrolyte, we've got, let me make that a different color. We've got copper two plus ions from the copper sulfate and we've got SO4 two minus, which are the sulfate ions. We would expect our metal ions to go to the cathode, which is what happens. So these copper ions will go to the cathode and they will plate that iron, um, which is exactly what we expect to happen. Usually, in the copper sulfate solution, remember you've got um, water in there. So we've also got hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Because hydrogen is more reactive than copper, it's copper that's produced at the iron nail. And usually when you've got sulfate and hydroxide ions, just like when we looked at the electrolysis of copper, instead of either of those being produced at the anode, because they're quite stable, instead the copper rod will become smaller and any copper that's in that copper rod will lose ions and it will lose copper two plus ions. So at the anode, instead of sulfate and hydroxide going there to then produce, for example, water, the copper ions from the copper rod are released. And so it's a really good process where you get lots of copper ions produced, which then go to the iron nail to then um, coat the iron nail in copper. So this is the process um, of electroplating where you use a less reactive metal to coat a more reactive metal. So um, another, for example, another metal I explained was silver. So in that process, you would still have an iron nail or a steel, um, something made of steel, and then you would have a silver rod and your solution would be something like silver nitrate. And that would then, the same process would happen, but with silver ions. Okay, so if we go back to then the final thing that you need to know about preventing rusting. So we've talked about electroplating. The other thing we need to know about is sacrificial protection. And the difference between electroplating and sacrificial protection is in electroplating, it's a less reactive metal. So nothing happens to that less reactive metal because it doesn't react with the oxygen or the water. So it essentially just protects the iron or steel underneath. But with sacrificial protection, a more reactive metal is placed on top of the iron or steel. So for example, um, aluminium is more react reactive than iron or steel. So if aluminium coated the iron or steel, it would react with the water and oxygen to produce aluminium oxide. So essentially it is sacrificing itself to protect the iron underneath and that is called sacrificial protection. Does anyone know what galvanization means? Galvanization. So it's quite a popular word used in this topic. Does anyone know what it means? Okay, good. So you're actually giving me answers that I want you to give me. Um, and I'll tell you that the answers I'm getting aren't correct. Um, and the reason I want you to give me these answers is because it's a very common misconception that galvanization is pretty much sacrificial protection. Galvanization is not sacrificial protection. It is a type of sacrificial protection that uses zinc. So if iron is coated with zinc, that is sacrificial protection, but another word for it is galvanization. If iron is coated with aluminium or sodium, that is sacrificial protection, but not galvanization. So galvanization is specifically if iron or steel is coated with zinc. So it is still sacrificial because zinc is more reactive, so it will react with the oxygen and water. So it's essentially sacrificing itself to protect the iron or steel underneath, but it's only used, galvanization is only used when we coat iron or steel with zinc. Um, so that's really important. So the difference between sacrificial protection um, and galvanization. So galvanization is sacrificial protection, but only with zinc. Excellent. Um, so well done everyone there. So let's just go back over the learning objectives for today and make sure everyone's happy. And then we'll do some exam questions um, on recycling. 
So evaluate the process of recycling. So hopefully you understand the advantages and disadvantages of it um, and what ingots are and things like that. So the processes um, that are involved. Know the process and condition in, conditions of rusting. So I've sent you the YouTube video to watch again, but essentially it's water and oxygen that are needed for rusting. Rusting is a type of corrosion. Um, so it's a type of corrosion, but that is only involving iron and steel. And explain the methods used to prevent rusting. So if you think about it in three different ways, you think about it as physical methods, which include painting, oiling, and adding a plastic. Um, electroplating, where you have to use electrolysis to coat the metal with a less reactive um, metal, so for example, silver or copper. And then the final one um, was sacrificial protection, where you use a more reactive metal, um, and that, warm, that more reactive metal will react with oxygen and water and essentially sacrifice itself. Which one do you think is the cheapest option? So if we go back, which one do you think is the cheapest option? Or why would someone choose one option over another? What do we think? Yeah, excellent. So the physical methods, so painting, oiling, coating of plastic are the cheapest options. Unfortunately, they don't tend to last long. So um, often, you know, paint can wear away. So it's really important that you have to kind of keep repainting and then that can build up costs. So a reason for a scientist um, potentially using something like electroplating is that it lasts a lot longer. Um, but yeah, physical methods because they are cheaper. Um, so the difference between electroplating and sacrificial protection is that when we use a more reactive metal, those more reactive metals tend to be really expensive. Um, and it's the same with less reactive metal, uh, less reactive metals as well, because, for example, silver, we know that's quite expensive. Gold is quite expensive. Um, so some metals aren't as expensive, but it's, it's all dependent on which metal you use. And then also the energy requirements for electroplating and sacrificial protection. Someone is saying sacrificial protection doesn't last long. Um, it lasts. It does last quite long. So, for example, sacrificial protection, if you used aluminium, which is more reactive, Remember I said that when metals corrode, they react with oxygen and water to produce an oxide. So for example, aluminium oxide, and that tends to protect the aluminium because that aluminium oxide layer doesn't get removed. Whereas when rusting occurs, rusting flakes off. So any iron that's underneath the rust will then re-rust once that rust flakes off. Whereas when you've got a, a metal such as aluminium sodium, when they react with oxygen and water, they produce an oxide layer that is almost protective. It doesn't get removed. So sacrificial protection can last quite a long time. There is one kind of condition um, which will speed up the process of rusting and will almost make these physical methods, electroplating and sacrificial protection, not last as long. Does anyone know what kind of condition would iron or steel need to be in to make rusting happen a lot quicker? So it's a condition where you've got oxygen and water, but what specifically, um, does anyone know what condition would make iron and rusting? Yep, so you're thinking on the right line, someone said acid rain, so you're thinking on the right lines there. So it is in an environment such as water. So I'll give you a clue. Um, if you remember, we can make fresh water from two sources. We can make it from rain and something else. What's the other source that we can make fresh water from? We don't do it in the UK, seawater, excellent. So salty water, such as seawater, um, can speed up the process of rusting um, a lot. Um, and so often when you put metals into seas, which is often needed um, as barricades and things, um, we have to use sacrificial protection or electroplating, which can be really expensive, but because they tend to be more protective than the physical methods, we have to kind of use that expense and we just have to do it because otherwise um, these metals will rust too quickly. Excellent, um, well done everyone. So I think we've just got something to explain and then we'll do an exam question. So Bola, if you want to come on, you can do. Hello everyone, good afternoon. I hope you are all doing well. Um, I just want to quickly let you know about the small group courses that we also run. As I'm, as I'm sure you guys have um, enjoyed um, Aman's session today um, and you guys already know about the one-on-one -on -one tuition that we do um, but alongside that one-on-one -on -one tuition we also run these smaller group courses um, so these are great because they're uh, much smaller than these large group um, courses that you guys are part of and you join um, they only have about six students and they happen every week and are around one hour per session um, next week, we're launching our physics, GCSE and A-level courses. So you can follow the link on the presentation or actually um, the link that I posted within the chat 
to find out a bit more about small group tutorials in general. Thank you. That's, that's all from me. Thanks. Guys. Thanks, Bola. Um, okay, so I said we'll do an exam question then um, to finish off today. Not here. Okay, so aluminium has many uses because of its low density, good electrical conductivity, flexibility and resistance to corrosion. Use the information in the flow chart, chart to suggest the benefits of recycling aluminium. So have a look at the flow chart and see if, see if you can suggest some benefits of recycling aluminium. It's a three mark question, which means that the exam question is looking for three different points. So you can always look at the number of marks to help you to um, decide how much you need to write. It's also a common misconception that if you write more, you get more marks. That's not always true because if you write something that's incorrect, you can actually lose marks, um, even if you've got lots of correct answers. So I would always be careful um, about writing too much. So any ideas on the benefits of recycling aluminium? So using the flowcharts, the flowchart says aluminium ore from open cast mining. You've got 50% of the ore is wasted. Aluminium oxide is separated and purified Aluminium is extracted by electrolysis at 950 degrees, waste carbon dioxide gas, and then aluminium metal is produced. So what are the benefits of recycling then? This shows how we extract it. What's the benefits of recycling it? Yep, so you can bullet point. Um, you definitely don't have to write out um, in English. So if, for example, they say they're looking for your written English, then yes, you do. But you can definitely bullet point. You don't lose marks for bullet pointing. I used to do that frequently in my exams. I found it really helpful. So you can definitely bullet point. So any ideas? Anyone got any answers then? What are the benefits of recycling aluminium? So if you have a look at the extraction process, what are we preventing from happening um, by recycling aluminium? Okay, so if we look at this part over here, where aluminium ore um, from open cast mining, um, you've then got waste rock, and then aluminium oxide is separated and purified and then extracted by electrolysis. If we don't need to do the electrolysis, how is that an advantage? What is it about electrolysis that makes it actually, that makes that electrolysis a bad process, but recycling a good process? What does electrolysis tend to use a lot of? Does anyone know? They've told us 950 degree temperature. So what does that mean? If we have to heat something up to 950 degrees, what does that mean we're using a lot of? Yep, excellent energy. So there's a lot of energy used. Um, and when we use that energy, often that energy comes from burning crude, crude oil and greenhouse gases are produced when we do that. So essentially we're saving energy. So one of your answer could be it reduces energy usage. So reduces energy usage. energy usage um, in electrolysis. Good, someone's talked about the carbon dioxide gas. So yep, yeah, you can talk about less CO2 being produced and therefore less global warming and less greenhouse gases. So less greenhouse gases. Anything else? We've got two points so far. Anyone got any other points there? What about actually getting um, the mining? What's the problem with mining itself and quarrying, for example? Good, yep, so mining and quarrying um, is a costly process. So, and also it requires drilling and energy. So if, for example, we're doing less mining, it means that it's less pollution to the environment from all the energy that's released and all the dust pollution. So remember when you mine and things, a lot of dust produced. So you can talk about that as your third point. Excellent, okay, so we will finish there for today. Thank you everyone for contributing. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the week. Um, it should be nice and sunny for the rest of the week. So take care, everyone. I will see you next week. Bye.